This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. We'll hear a discussion about a visit to the zoo. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Welcome to Geno Zoo. How can I help you? Yes, I'm interested in coming to the zoo with three visitors from Japan. I know you've got all the animals, but my guests would really like to get up close to the animals, something different and unique. Do you offer special tours? As a matter of fact, we do. We offer three tours. We have our Snakes Unlimited tour, we have a Birds Galore tour, and we also have a special behind-the-scenes tour which takes you to our animal hospital where you get to see all the injured animals and how we look after them. Oh, right. Well, one of the girls is studying to be a vet, so I think the behind-the-scenes tour would probably appeal to her. I think Tomo would like to hold a snake and the birds sound fascinating too. Tell me, is it possible to do all three tours? Yes, actually it is. The Snakes Unlimited Tour kicks off at a quarter past ten and goes for an hour. The second tour with the birds start at around noon and the last tour happens at half past two. So it is possible to do all the tours during your visit to the zoo. Great. Now, the only thing I want to know is how much does all this cost? Well, let's see. The admission price is fifteen ninety-five, and the tours are extra. If you're interested in the snakes tour, it's going to cost five fifty, but that price includes being able to hold a python. The birds tour is where you get to hold an adult eagle. That one costs six fifty, and um, I think the third tour costs nine fifty. Yes, and you get to hand feed the baby kangaroos. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. <laughs> Yes, well, it sounds like a lot of fun. I think my guests will be really interested in all three of the tours. I'm unfamiliar with the layout of the zoo. Tell me, where do we need to meet for the first tour? Well, all the tours, in fact, leave from the same spot, and that is just beside the cafe. OK. Now, as I said, they're from Japan, so English is not their first language. Is there anyone there that could help with translation if we need it? Yes, there is an interpreter, but unfortunately she isn't available for all the tours, so they'll have to ask her any questions they may have after the tour. All the tours are given in English. I'm sure you'll find that the information will be readily understandable for your guests. Okay, then. As you know, everything is outdoors apart from the third tour, so you might want to tell your guests to bring a hat and some sunscreen. Thanks for the tip. You've been very helpful. Bye. You're welcome. See you at the zoo. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2. You will hear a representative of a city council giving information about two new facilities which are opening soon in the city. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to say a little about two exciting new developments in the city. The Brackenside Open Air Swimming Pool and the Children's Adventure Playground in Central Park. As many of you may know, the idea for these initiatives came from you, the public in the extensive consultation exercise which the City Council conducted last year. And they have been realised using money from the SWRDC, the South West Regional Development Commission. First of all, Brackenside Pool. As many of the older members of the audience will remember, there used to be a wonderful open-air pool on the seafront 30 years ago, but it had to close when it was judged to be unsafe. For the design of this new heated pool, we were very happy to secure the talents of internationally renowned architect Ellen Wendon, who has managed to combine a charming 1930s design, which fits in so well with many of the other buildings in the area, with up-to-the-minute features such as a recycling system, the only one of its kind in the world, which enables seawater to be used in the pool. Now, there's been quite a bit of discussion in the local press about whether there would be enough room for the number of visitors we're hoping to attract, but the design is deceptive, and there have been rigorous checks about capacity. Also, just in case you were wondering, we're on schedule for a June the 15th opening date, and well within budget, a testimony to the excellent work of local contractors Hickman's. We hope that as many people as possible will be there on June the 15th, we have engaged award-winning actress Coral White to declare the pool open, and there'll be drinks and snacks available at the poolside. There'll also be a competition for the public to decide on the sculpture we plan to have at the entrance. You will decide which famous historical figure from the city we should have. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. And now, moving on to the Central Park Playground, which we're pleased to announce has just won the Douglas Award for Safety. The news came through only last week. The unique design is based on the concept of the global village, with the playground being divided into six areas showing different parts of the world each with a representative feature. For example, there is a section on Asia, and this is represented by rides and equipment in the shape of snakes, orangutans, tigers and so on, fauna native to the forests of the region. Moving south to the Antarctic, we couldn't run to an ice rink, I'm afraid, but opted instead for climbing blocks in the shape of mountains. I thought they could have had slides for the glaciers, but the designers did want to avoid being too literal. Then on to South America, and here the theme is El Dorado, games replicating the search for mines full of precious stones. And then, moving up to North America, here there was considerable debate. I know the contribution of cinema and jazz was considered, but the designers finally opted for rockets and the International Space Station. 
eastwards to Europe then, and perhaps the most traditional choice of all the areas, medieval castles and other fortifications. Then last but not least, moving south to Africa, add a whole set of wonderful mosaics and trails to represent the great rivers of this fascinating and varied continent. Now, the opening date for our global playground is the 10th of July. And again, we'd love to see you there. So, make a date and come and see this magnificent, original new amenity right in the heart of the city. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a discussion between students about a university assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, as you know, we have to plan and conduct a survey. How should we organise this? Well, I think we should divide up the task and then assign them to people who want to do them. I think that's a good idea. I don't want to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if we divide up the tasks, no one will feel as though they are doing all the work. Even distribution, it's fair. I've done it this way before, and it's always worked out quite well. Yes, I agree, but what if some tasks are longer than others? Then it doesn't seem fair. Well, then we have to make sure we divide the tasks up according to time estimates. Some tasks may take longer, for example, the interview stage, and others shorter, like perhaps the layout of the survey form. OK then, Carol. That sounds like a great idea. I seem to recall reading somewhere in our lecture notes that dividing up tasks was highly recommended for group work, so I feel good about what we're doing. OK then, what are the tasks and who wants to do them? Well, at the moment, I'm studying layout and design, so if nobody has any objections, I'd like to work out the design of the survey. I'll have this finished by mid-March, the 23rd to be exact. I've got other assignments to do around that time. That's fine with me. I hate design and layout. What about organising the questions? Someone's going to have to do this. Could I? I promise to be all finished by mid-March. What do you think, Carol? Yes, that all sounds good. I guess someone's going to have to do the questioning. Why don't I conduct the survey? The assignment is due on April the 3rd, so I will have the survey completed by late March, just in time for the oral report. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Yes, about that oral report, does anyone have any notes from last lecture? There were some good ideas about how to give a good oral report. Yes, I happen to have them right here. There were some very helpful suggestions given by Professor Thompson. Should we take a moment to go through them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, firstly, the report itself is due after the survey has been handed in. I believe our group will be presenting it on the 12th of April. 12th of April? That's the date of my counting exam. Anyway, Professor Thompson said we mustn't speak longer than 20 minutes, or less than 15. He said when it comes to assigning grades, he will be looking for speakers to maintain eye contact with the audience. 
In other words, don't just stand up and read the presentation. That's been my problem in the past. I spend all my time looking at my notes and the audience gets bored. Yes, that's right. Another point to remember is to make good use of gestures. Standing there like a robot is also very boring for the class. Another thing to consider is visual aids. He said we should include a variety of them, things like overhead transparencies, handouts. We can use the whiteboard. DVDs or video were also suggested. OK, let's decide who wants to do what. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture about the history of weather forecasting. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this series of lectures about the history of weather forecasting, I'll start by examining its early history. That'll be the subject of today's talk. OK, so we'll start by going back thousands of years. Most ancient cultures had weather gods, and weather catastrophes, such as floods, played an important role in many creation myths. Generally, weather was attributed to the whims of the gods, as the wide range of weather gods in various cultures shows. For instance, there's the Egyptian sun god Ra, and Thor, the Norse god of thunder and lightning. Many ancient civilizations developed rites such as dances in order to make the weather gods look kindly on them. But the weather was of daily importance. Observing the skies and drawing the correct conclusions from these observations was really important. In fact, their survival depended on it. It isn't known when people first started to observe the skies, but at around 650 BC, the Babylonians produced the first short-range weather forecasts based on their observations of clouds and other phenomena. The Chinese also recognized weather patterns, and by 300 BC, astronomers had developed a calendar which divided the year into 24 festivals, each associated with a different weather phenomenon. The ancient Greeks were the first to develop a more scientific approach to explaining the weather. 
The work of the philosopher and scientist Aristotle in the 4th century BC is especially noteworthy as his ideas held sway for nearly 2,000 years. In 340 BC, he wrote a book in which he attempted to account for the formation of rain, clouds, wind and storms. He also described celestial phenomena such as halos, that is, bright circles of light around the sun, the moon and bright stars, and comets. Many of his observations were surprisingly accurate. For example, he believed that heat could cause water to evaporate, but he also jumped to quite a few wrong conclusions, such as that winds are breathed out by the earth. Errors like this were rectified from the Renaissance onwards. For nearly 2,000 years, Aristotle's work was accepted as the chief authority on weather theory. Alongside this, though, in the Middle Ages, weather observations were passed on in the form of proverbs, such as red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Many of these are based on very good observations and are accurate, as contemporary meteorologists have discovered. For centuries, any attempt to forecast the weather could only be based on personal observations. But in the 15th century, scientists began to see the need for instruments. Until then, the only ones available were weather vanes to determine the wind direction and early versions of rain gauges. One of the first, invented in the 15th century, was a hygrometer which measured humidity. This was one of many inventions that contributed to the development of weather forecasting. In 1592, the Italian scientist and inventor Galileo developed the world's first thermometer. His student Torricelli later invented the barometer, which allowed people to measure atmospheric pressure. In 1648, the French philosopher Pascal proved that pressure decreases with altitude. This discovery was verified by English astronomer Halley in 1686, and Halley was also the first person to map trade winds. This increasing ability to measure factors related to weather helped scientists to understand the atmosphere and its processes better, and they started collecting weather observation data systematically. In the 18th century, the scientist and politician Benjamin Franklin carried out work on electricity and lightning in particular, but he was also very interested in weather and studied it throughout most of his life. It was Franklin who discovered that storms generally travel from west to east. In addition to new meteorological instruments, other developments contributed to our understanding of the atmosphere. People in different locations began to keep records, and in the mid-19th century, the invention of the telegraph made it possible for these records to be collated. This led, by the end of the 19th century, to the first weather services. It was not until the early 20th century that mathematics and physics became part of meteorology. And we'll continue from that point next week.
That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.